What's up, everybody? Welcome into another edition of The Sit Down, an organized crime and mafia podcast. Hope you're all having a great day. We are back another week, another new episode of The Sit Down. Uh, and it's really my favorite time of the week. Um, you know, I will say this um, as you get older, your things you look forward to wane less and less, right? There are things where, like, I'm not at the point where I'm seven or eight years old where I'm walking down to get the mail and that's exciting, but uh, it's always nice to have things to look forward to, uh, especially now with stuff just opening up. It's still not really summer yet, uh, but we got to sit down and it's always great to record this. We get a big time show today. Yet again, every show we do at this point is big. Every time we do a show, it's something to look forward to. Um, and uh, yeah, we're continuing to gain steam. So thanks for listening. Uh, if you're joining us this week, had a great show last week on Big Joey and Messino. It was well recepted. Uh, and this week, we got another big one Carmine the Snake Persigo. You never call him the Snake to his face, but it was pretty evident his entire life why he was called the Snake. We'll get into all sorts of uh, debauchery with Car uh, Carmine Persigo, really starting from the beginning. Uh, let's bring in our co host, the great Blackjack Fletcher. Blackjack is our. Uh, legal expert. He's our coach. He's our consigliere. He does a little bit of everything on this show. Blackjack, how you doing? How's your week going? Week's going fantastic, brother. I mean, think about it. I get to sit here and talk about one of the more interesting people in the history of American organized crime with you for the next hour or so. What could be better? Yeah, and I got to tell you, I know we were talking recently and you were telling me is it correct you're drinking a little bit more amaretto stuff with amaretto i will tell you uh in preparation the for the show, show tonight i made myself a little uh ravioli with a nice arrabbiata sauce whoa uh, i did i did in preparation to get myself in the right headspace so uh Love yeah that. you know i'm really really going into the method acting portion of of hosting a little sugo arrabbiata which is there you uh go. you know very uh, red, a lot of red pepper flakes, as they say. Love That's it. Right. It's funny because speaking of arrabbiata sauce in the Sopranos, if you remember when Tony gets, Tony has like various drivers throughout the show. Mm -hmm. One of them was Tony Saragusa, funny enough, but uh, he gets a driver in season six, I believe, early season six. He's like a young guy. He's bald. He's like a, a weightlifter. And it's funny because in one of the scenes, they kind of reference that he's a bodybuilder and he's got red pepper flakes up his ass. And Sill, I believe, calls him Penny Arrabbiata. It was funny. And I, <laughs> every time I hear Penny Arrabbiata, I think of that. Uh, but shout out to you. Uh, it's always nice to get a little kick in your gravy, as, the, as they That's say. That's right, buddy. So, That's right. Uh, I love that. How about that? Um, yeah, it, it's always a great time to get your, get your gravy, get your pasta, get some wine, sit back and relax. And watch, uh, or sorry, and listen to the sit down. So let's get into it. Uh, as always, I again want to thank everybody for checking out the show. Uh, if you enjoy what you're hearing, uh, we're here every week. Make sure you hit the subscribe button. Uh, make sure you let us know what you think of the show in the review section. Give us five stars if you can. Um, we have a lot of plans for this show. Hopefully, we can create a YouTube channel. I think, and you know, I've always said there are many great shows we can do that are that are full length shows, but. You know, over the years, there are so many great stories about the mob and about organized crime that I think could be really thrown into like a kind of a short type of, of video where, you know, each each day you throw it out, just kind of a cool, fun fact or something interesting. Yeah. Um, so a lot to do, a lot to shake out with this show. We thank everybody for watching. Let's get in uh, to the show here. Obviously, we can't sit here and talk about Arabiata and stuff forever. <laughs> uh, Carmine Persco is who we're talking about today. And Carmine is a fascinating individual, um, really outside of, I don't think anybody, I, I'm not sure if you can find a more devious individual, um, really from a high level standpoint of the mob. Carmine obviously fits into the boss uh, territory. He was a big time boss. He was a boss for a multitude of reasons, one of which he was manipulative, two, um, he was an earner, three, he was a killer. And we've talked about that time and time again. If you're able to do both, it doesn't matter if you're Irish, doesn't matter if you're Italian. Uh, it really doesn't matter. If you're one of the two uh, in both, um, you will be successful. And Carmine was devious on top of it. He made some good connections. Um, but the deviousness that he had and the uh, constantly uh, looking to involve uh, family, which we'll talk about down the road, 
Um, a lot went on in Carmine's life. And uh, Blackjack, devious is a great word for Carmine Persico, isn't it? I mean, it really is. As we'll talk about, there are he makes some maneuvers and and moves during the course of his life that, when you hear, you're just gonna you're just gonna shake your head a little bit and kind of wonder what he was thinking. But yeah, the, the, he was a slippery character. Yeah, it really was. Let's get into it. Uh, Carmine Persigo on the sit down. Carmine John Persigo Jr. was born August eighth, nineteen thirty three, in Brooklyn, New York, to Carmine Persigo Sr. And Asunta Piantamura. Uh, Carmine was one of three boys. Uh, his brothers, uh, Teddy and Alphonse Alleyboy Persico, they both were involved with the mob as well. And that's something that when you look at Carmine, he was very loyal to his family. They followed him into the gates of hell, basically. Um, and it's interesting because during Carmine's really early years, uh, his family you know, moved uh, between Carroll Gardens and Red Hook in Brooklyn. But you know, Carmine Sr., his father, was uh, a pretty successful guy. He was uh, a great dad. He was uh, one that gave his family a good living. Uh, he was a stenographer uh, in Manhattan. I worked at different law firms. He had a really good job. And, you know, Bacha, you, you've come from a law background. You would agree a stenographer, very good job, something that even in, you know, the 30s and 40s, I mean, that's a fantastic job. Yeah, I mean, we would call them court reporters today or, you know, something like that, depending on what your jurisdiction is. But listen, it's a good job today, right? I mean, it's not a bad job by any stretch of the imagination. These people, people make good money doing that in the thirties and forties. I would imagine that would be a very good job. Like you would live a, a fairly comfortable middle upper middle class life having that job. Yeah. Carmine though, interestingly enough, didn't really necessarily follow at all in his father's footsteps. You know, generally when you hear about mob guys, they have kind of a weird childhood or, you know, they're around the wrong people or their fathers are involved. Uh, Carmine's wasn't, but it didn't really face him. Uh, by 16, Carmine Persico was uh, basically a, a juvenile delinquent. And I always reference, whenever I think of Carmine Persico, I always think of two photos that he t took in his life. Carmine was not a guy that was photographed a whole hell of a lot. For his being as devious as he was, you weren't going to see him much on video. He wasn't out there in the open talking about things. Uh, he wasn't John Gotti or anything, but there's a photo of Carmine Persico Blackjack as a uh, you know, 15, 16 year old where he gets jammed up uh, on a murder beef, which we'll talk about in a second. And it, it's fascinating because the zoomed in photo is him at the desk of a precinct somewhere in New York. And both cops are looking away and you see him directly looking at the camera. And he just looks like a devious, uh, delinquent kind of kid. Um, and I always think of Carmine. It, it really was kind of the start of his criminal career by 16 Carmine was part of a group called the South Brooklyn boys. They were a gang um, and they basically succeeded a gang that had been disbanded um, by 17 Carmine Persco is arrested on a murder beat. Uh, basically he beats up another kid in a park. Uh, it's one of those things, you know, he maybe hits him for a little too long, hits him in the wrong spot and he kills somebody. Uh, he eventually um, grabs the charges uh, it was also talk around the neighborhood that Carmine actually committed another murder as well uh, at the same age, and that his uh, brother, Alley Boy Persco, took the rap for it, uh, basically drawing a long sentence, but Junior wouldn't have had to worry about it. So uh, he gets the one murder beef, and Carmine beats it. Back in those days, you know, in the 50s, early 50s, it wasn't like today where they have DNA evidence and they can look through cameras and all that kind of stuff. If you murdered someone, Blackjack, you had to have multiple witnesses. You needed someone, a cop looking at it, something like that. Uh, Carmine beat the rap. And that really set off, at least early in his career, uh, a lot of, of luck for, 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 for Junior Persico. Yeah. And, and Jeff, I mean, I think you'd agree that, you know, we've, we've talked about a lot of different people on this show and kind of how they've gotten their start in organized crime. I don't think we've talked about anybody who's committed a murder by 17. That is, that is young to be that deep into it, especially for someone that we just talked about most likely came from a, a middle upper middle-class neighborhood, you know, a good upbringing, a solid family to be committing murders at 17. I mean, Carmine jumped in with both feet. Yeah, he really did. And, you know, you always wonder kind of, you know, the criminal mind is if a fascinating one, but you always wonder like, where, where did it go wrong for Carmine? You know, he's obviously, you know, taught, you know, I think right from wrong, um, you know, but 
you know, at the end of the day, you can parent a kid all you want. Um, you know, sometimes he's going to go out and do his own things. And, and Carmine was always just drawn to, you know, fighting and, and, you know, something just went too far. Uh, as I s- said, the uh, charges would eventually be dropped against a Carmine. Uh, and by that time, he had already been running around with uh, mob folks. Um, he started getting the attention of a captain in the Profaci crime family. Now, before the Colombo crime family, it was called the Profaci crime family. Uh, Carmine gets the attention of a guy called Frank about a Marco. Uh, they called him Frankie shots. Um, about a Marco is a, an interesting guy. He was kind of the, the boss uh, in that area. And he was big into the numbers, a racket. Uh, and he was schooling a lot of young mobsters. Uh, he was kind of the mentor for the Gallo brothers. And that's where Carmine gets introduced to Joe Gallo and his brothers. Um, they really looked up to Frank about Marco. He was kind of a father figure in the streets um, and they had a lot of respect for him. Uh, Carmine took to the mob life pretty easily. He started making money, started running numbers, started giving out loans, doing bookmaking. Uh, then he started committing burglaries and truck hijackings. Um, and again, Carmine continues to um, get arrested, not bad an eye. By basically the age of 20, he had been arrested 15 times, one of which was for a murder. Um, but you know, he continued to get arrested because they wouldn't keep him in jail. He was always kind of skating. He was doing a couple of days. Uh, and he was out. And this is also when he starts working with crazy Joe Gallo and then Albert and Lawrence Gallo. Uh, they were doing scores and, and setting up things, really kind of connecting themselves as kind of a farm team to a, to a mob captain, uh, which again, any good mob captain has soldiers. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were definitely uh, putting on an audition for Frank about a Marco by 1957. Um, there started to become some cracks developing in other families, uh, one of which was in the Anastasia crime family, which would become the Gambino crime family. The head of uh, the Anastasia crime family, Albert Anastasia, was becoming dissented by uh, members of the family. There were young guys that really wanted to kind of grab control. Uh, and there was a guy called Carlo Gambino, his underboss, who was getting older. He wanted to take control. So he starts conspiring with other bosses and basically saying, look, uh, Albert's got to go. His time has passed. Um, Are you going to, you know, write off on this? And so he goes to Vito Genovese, who runs the Genovese family and Joe Profaci, who ran the Profacis and said, look, I I want one of your guys' groups to take this over and and, and get rid of Anastasia. I want to, you know, kind of be devious myself. And black chick, Albert Anastasia had to go. Yeah, I... (laughs) He did, um, but this is no small task, right? Albert Anastasia is not, you know, just any mobster. He is one of the, you know, looming, towering figures in this, in this life. I mean, this is the guy who was the leader of Murder, Inc., you know, who is responsible for God knows how many murders. I mean, he is a legendary figure in this world. And so this is a hell of a task for a, at this point, 23-year-old Carmine Persico. Um, And you know that by accepting it, if you do it and you do it right, it's going to be a hell of a springboard. Yeah, and I mean, it didn't help that, I mean, Albert Anastasia was doing some of his own misdeeds. I mean, if if you know anything about Albert Anastasia, he ends up killing Vincent Mangano, kind of blaming it on that he was attacked and he did it. And yeah, you know, that didn't, you know, Vito Genovese wasn't happy about that. A lot of people weren't happy about that. He also started muscling into, uh, you know, Cuba and, and going against Meyer Lansky, Lansky's wishes. And, you know, the commission was just kind of sick of, of Albert Anastasia. So, you know, not you know, the fact that there was an up and comer that could take control of the family um, that obviously boded well for, for getting rid of, of uh, Anastasia. So obviously they need people to take care of this and, you know, who, who, who do they go to? They go to Carmine Persco and the Gallo brothers. So basically, uh, on October 25th, 1957, uh, Albert Anastasia had a weekly visit to a barber shop at the Park Sheraton Hotel in Manhattan. I mean, Mike, you know where that is. That's a bustling area. Um, you know, it's Midtown. It's just busy. north of Times Square. It's like 7th Avenue and 55th. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, not too far away. He sat in chair four. And as he's getting a shave, he's, he's leaned back with the towel around his uh, you know, kind of a really calming atmosphere. Uh, several gunmen barge into the barbershop. They throw the barber out of the way and basically start pumping Albert Anastasia full of bullets. Uh, Albert is so 
uh, surprised that he lunges at the shooters. Uh, he then collapsed and dies. Um, now, over the years, there's been a lot of questions about who actually killed uh, Albert Anastasia. It's been pretty proven at this point that it was Joe Gallo, Carmine Persico, and uh, one other Gallo brother. It, it was not, th- there was a random, like, Richard Klinsky was part of it. Like, just yeah, okay. idiotic theories. But, um, you know, it's funny because later in life, Carmine Persico um, actually boasted about doing the deed. Like, he, he talked about it and, you know, that Joe Gallo got all the credit, but you know, he was part of it. And, and, and that's really what springboarded Carmine Persico into the eyes of not only the Profaci crime family, but um, the other families as well. Uh, by the late 1950s and around this time, um, people started also to become sick of the leader of their own family. Persico, the Gallo, they're becoming increasingly kind of disillusioned with Joe Profaci. By this point, Profaci was greedy. Um, he wanted, you know, just high tributes. He just was kind of bleeding them to death. And, you know, he was kind of squeezing the quarter to the eagle screams, as they say. And people were getting sick of that. You can't act like that. You have to give people, you know, uh, the ability to go out and earn and not not steal from them. Uh, and Joe Profaci was doing that. People were tired of it. It also didn't help that Joe Profaci orders Frank about a Marco killed. And in 1959, it happens. Uh, Persico and the gals are furious. That was their mentor. And that just added to the fact that Joe Profaci had to be moved out of the way. Um, they were done with this. Uh, so basically there's dissent and Carlo Gambino and um, Gitano Lucchese started kind of going to the gals and saying, look, you and Persico should, you know, kind of start a war, if you will. I mean, this about a Marco is bleeding everybody. Uh, we're kind of sick of him. Why don't you guys take control of the family? Uh, so in 1961, the Gallo faction starts kind of putting the wheels in motion. They kidnap various um, high-ranking members of the Profaci crime family, including Joe Colombo, who's a Capo, Capo regime. And this basically gets Profaci's attention. He says, you know what? Maybe I was too greedy. I don't want to, you know, kind of have a war here. Let, let's broker some sort of deal. Uh, and the gallows then um, kind of released the captives and things kind of work itself out. The problem was, as you know, with money, Blackjack, you know, you'll give it a week or two, but then you get sick of it. You rig nig on the deal. And that's exactly what Profaci did. Uh, and look, the gallows were, were tough son of a bitches. They're not going to just, you know, say, OK, uh, they're going to go back to war. And, and Profaci had been wearing out his welcome as the boss of the uh, of the crime family. Yeah, I don't know what he was thinking. I mean, if you if you look at this objectively, right? Like the gallows come out and they grab four of your top guys, right? They grab two capos, your underboss, and a soldier. You flee, right? Like you're hauling ass out of town because you know you're next. You reach this settlement. And then you immediately balk and renege on it. Like, what do you think is going to happen? They're going to do the exact same shit. They obviously have one up on you and you're just going to say, screw it. Let's do it again. Yeah. You know, I I always, I always kind of connected to to this. If you remember in a Bronx tale, there's a scene when Sonny and C are in the, the, the restaurant and they're talking about, is it better to be loved or feared? And, uh, Sonny starts talking about how, he gives his men enough, but not too much where they don't need him, but enough where they're happy. And Joe Profaccio wasn't doing that. He was literally stealing from everyone and saying, I'm the guy, I'm the guy, I'm the boss. I'm going to take everything and you're just going to have to fucking put up with it. And again, people like Joe Gallo and, and Carmine Persica were not going to just sit back and say, yeah, fuck that. You know, they're going to protect. They believed in Cosa Nostra and they wanted to, to earn as well. Um, but this is when Carmen Persica really starts, you start to wonder about his loyalty and, and he becomes that snake that he earned the nickname uh, for. Uh, Carmen Persico basically starts thinking that um, maybe he is better off with Profaci. Maybe he can use this to his advantage. And basically he knows that most of the money that's being earned is going to Joe Profaci. So maybe he can, kind of align himself with Profaci and he'll be looked at as like kind of the good soldier and uh, he'll get a pat on the back and he'll start getting rackets. So what he does is he contacts 
Joe Profacci, and they kind of work at a deal where Carmine will get some lucrative, um, you know, kind of rackets, and um, he would kind of disloyal himself from the Persico, uh, for, from the Gallo faction. So keep in mind, these were friends of his, but he went behind their back and basically said, fuck the Gallos, I'm with Profacci now, which was pretty devious. Um, on August 12th, 1961, Karma not only um, goes behind their back, but also starts setting them up. Larry Gallo, uh, Joe's brother, is basically summoned to a meeting at this Hera Lounge in Brooklyn, he thinks, to discuss um, kind of what's going on with, with Joe Profacci. The, the Gallos still believe that Persico is part of their crew and that he's with them. When Joe Gallo or when Lawrence Gallo arrives, uh, Persico and several other uh, of his men attack uh, Larry and basically start choking him with um, kind of a, a, a leather instrument of some sort. Uh, lucky for Larry Gallo, though, wildly enough, a policeman walks into the bar that they're at somehow. It's the luckiest situation involving a policeman ever. And Persico and other folks basically flee the restaurant. And this is where Carlo gets the nickname, the snake. Um, people started to get on notice that you can't trust Carmine Persigo and the gallows basically get furious and they start kind of going after Carmine. So Blackjack, this is a devious thing to do. And um, how about that cop walking in? Larry Gallo should send him a fruit basket every Christmas. I mean, it's fair to say Larry Gallo was never so pleased to see a police officer in his entire fucking life. So, I mean, that's one thing. The other thing is, and this will be something of a trend in, in this episode, this is one of those decisions by Carmine Persico that you're going to sit back and say, why the fuck did you do that? Like, yeah. it, by all accounts, the gallows seem to have the upper hand in this conflict. Like, he had worked with the gallows before. He had known them for a long time. They seem to be winning this war, and you're going to decide... Nah, I'm going to switch sides. I'm going to go with Profaci, and I'm going to try to strangle this guy. I mean, you have just put a gigantic target on your back. Yeah, I mean, Carmine just sometimes, I think, did a little too much. Um, you know, I think if he would have just probably rode this out and, you know, kind of let, in a way, let them take each other out, he could have just kind of assumed control. But, you know, Carmine wanted to be devious and, um, you know, get involved in the weeds. And this is where things kind of get interesting for Carmine Persico. He's now at war basically with the Gallo brothers and everyone's happy on 1960 in 1962 because Joe Profaci dies of cancer. Um, kind of a lucky break for the Gallows. Uh, Joe Migliaccio becomes the new family boss. Um, but there's a war going on between Persico and the Gallows. In 1963, the Gallows bomb a car uh, Junior Persico is in, but he somehow escapes with just minor injuries. Um, then again, in late, uh, or sorry, in mid-1963, Gallo gunmen locate Carmine Persico in Gowanus, Brooklyn, and basically uh, ambush him. They start lighting up his car, and Carmine survives. He's shot in the face, the hand, and the shoulder. Uh, Carmine also, and I, I, I've always said this, I think Carmine should have been nicknamed the cat because you're right. You're right. He had nine lives when it comes to when it comes to the death attempts. Like he was a trooper, he was tough. And there was a report that when he was shot in the face by the gunman, he spit the bullet out as it <laughs> entered his face, which is really kind of a dude, an old that's wise so thing. badass. It really it is. is such a badass move. Can you imagine? being shot in the fucking face and your response is to spit the bullet out. Yeah. That is unbelievable. Yeah. It's really, um, it's just kind of one of those things. It's, it's like almost unheard of really. Um, he was definitely a tough guy, Carmen Persico for sure. Um, in 1963, uh, some of the, uh, the luck runs out for um, the gallows and for, Carmine Persico. Carmine gets arrested for extortion. Uh, Joe Gallo also gets arrested, and they both go to jail. Uh, and Brooklyn calms down a little bit. Um, there was a lot, a lot going on, a lot of attempts on people's lives. 
Uh, but they both go to jail and um, things kind of calm down. Uh, Joe Migliaccio, though, wouldn't be boss for long. He's forced out by the commission and replaced by a new boss named Joe Colombo, who would uh, basically change the namesake of the family and it would become the Colombo crime family. Um, and Carmine is a loyalist to Colombo and he's rewarded with named Capo while he's in prison. Uh, becoming regime, Capo regime, that's big news for Carmine. Carmine obviously starts as a young whippersnapper on the street that, that's doing work uh, for, for mob bosses. And you know now he's, he's a Capo you know, pretty quickly. I mean, keep in mind, Carmine's only 30 years old at this point. Um, one thing that happens, though, is this is, again, where one thing about Carmen Persco, we've talked about a lot of bosses like Joe Messino and um, guys like that. Um, John Gotti. John was always really lucky with the police. But mm -hmm. this is where Carmine starts to get really unlucky. He, Carmine went to jail a lot. Uh, he was indicted a lot. Blackjack, as you know. Um, but even though he would get indicted, they were still making money. Uh, Carmine's crew is one of the most profitable in the family. Um, and, um, you know, he was doing a lot uh, and people were getting, uh, people were noticing it. Uh, by 1968, uh, Carmine is, is again uh, uh, arrested and convicted on federal hijacking charges. Uh, it was said that the reason he was jammed up in that was because of the famous uh, appearance of Joe Valachi. Joe Valachi basically admits that the mob is a thing and he starts going on camera and talking about it. Uh, and he was actually a prosecution witness for Carmine Persco in this case. Uh, Carmine ends up getting uh, eight years for this federal hijacking charge. Uh, so he goes away. Uh, and for a little bit, the snake slithers back uh, into the grass. Uh, and we, we don't hear from him for a couple of years. By this point in 1971, Joe Gallo is released from prison uh, after basically doing seven years, uh, seven and a half years. And this is interesting because while Joe Gallo's in prison, um, things happen. Joe starts uh, kind of a new outlook on the mob. Uh, Joe was still a fairly prominent person in the mob, but he becomes kind of connected with black gangs. He goes into Greenhaven up in, in New York. He's in state prison, and he starts hanging out with um, Mickey Barnes, who is a drug trafficker from Harlem. Uh, they start kind of creating um, kind of these rackets and how Joe can connect Cosa Nostra to African-American gangs and how they can kind of do work together and, and recruit each other and, and, and kind of be one big happy family. Which basically. is not common at that time by any stretch. And keep in mind, a lot of people, particularly in Cosa Nostra, were not happy with this. Um, you know, again, in prison, and it's a lot different than on the street, you know, prison is, is very, you know, you hang with, you know, your group. So if you're Italian, you hang with Italians. If you're black, you hang out with the blacks. If you're, you know, Mexican, you hang out with the Mexicans. Uh, Joe was, was moving around a lot with, with black gangs and, and people weren't happy about that. Um, so as this all happens, Joe starts reading as well. Uh, he becomes kind of enamored by different hobbies and things of that nature. Um, and according to a fellow inmate when he was at Auburn, Gallo's philosophy was to be the best you can be, whether it was a car driver, a gangster, never settle for second rate. Gallo started reading a lot of Machiavelli and things of that nature. So he becomes articulate, that kind of thing. While he's in prison, his brother Larry dies of cancer. So when Joe comes out, his new kind of thing is, I want to again assume control of this family. And Carmen Purse goes in jail, so you know I could take on Colombo. Why can't I do that, right? Uh, Joe Colombo was also people were getting sick of. Joe Colombo mm -hmm. was the boss for only a couple of years, but Joe starts putting his name out there. He starts getting on TV. He starts seeing him doing these big rallies about – uh, anti-defamation he creates this league called the uh, italian american civil rights league and starts doing rallies and you know he's very pro-italian he's as you know though when you're in things of that nature you've got to be on camera and the commission starts to get sick and tired of seeing joe colombo all the time uh, yeah. and joe gallo did too for that matter 
Uh, and on May 22nd, 19, or sorry, on in, in 1971 in June, Joe Colombo has a rally in Manhattan and Joe Gallo basically says, you know what? I'm going to get rid of this fucking guy. Uh, so he sends a black um, shooter called Jerome Johnson, who uh, basically shoots and severely wounds Joe Colombo. Uh, he's immediately shot by Colombo's bodyguards and Joe Colombo would never recover. He would survive in a paralyzed state until the late seventies, but uh, law enforcement kind of concluded that Gallo had kind of figured this all out because he was the only one that had built ties with black gangsters. Uh, and that's really where Joe Gallo kind of says, you know what, I'm going to take this in my own hands by check. Yeah. I mean, there's a few things here, right? I mean, first of all, it's a, it's a ballsy move by Gallo to do this. Um, and second of all, you know, when you said about Colombo starting the Italian American Civil Rights League, I'm sure a lot of our listeners were doing the same thing I was doing, which is just shaking my head. Because how many times do we see when you're the boss and you attract attention, it is going to be your downfall. It, you can't do it. You are running a criminal enterprise. You cannot attract attention. You can't be on TV. You can't be in the newspapers. It's a bad look. So, yeah, Colombo was probably going to go one way or the other, but it's a ballsy move for Gallo to do this, you know, a couple of months after getting out of prison. Yeah, and it was kind of obvious who did it because, you know, law enforcement was kind of aware that Joe Gallo was moving around with black gangs and he knew Nikki Barnes, and it was just kind of – in this day and age – the mob was not farming things out to black gangs. They just weren't doing it. Uh, in 1971, while this is going on, Carmine's still in prison. Uh, this all happens, but Carmine gets jammed up again on 37 counts of extortion, uh, all stemming from a loan checking operation he had in Manhattan. Um, however, in late 1971, a jury acquits Carmine Persco of all charges, which is pretty wild. Uh, 37 counts is nothing to sneeze at. It's not like it's a quick one or two things, um, all 12 witnesses said they could not identify Carmine Persco. So uh, Blackjack, you're a, you're a smart guy. You were a lawyer. You would assume that there were some payoffs there. I think that they had to have bought 24 people because 37 counts. I mean, 37 counts and you get not guilties on all of them. That is not only uncommon, it's virtually impossible. I mean, they could charge you and I with 37 counts and you'll get a guilty on one of them. I mean, it's just the, the law of averages. And to have all 12 witnesses, all 12, say they can't identify him, there was a lot of money changing hands for that trial. Yeah, uh, couldn't agree more. Uh, it was definitely, there was definitely something going on there. Um, obviously, when Gallo does the Columbo hit, you assume that he's going to become boss, but it didn't happen. Uh, Joe Iacovelli is named acting boss. And th this is really where I think the, the commission and the mob in general, I think we're done with Joe Gallo. Um, they were sick and tired of the wars. They were sick and tired of him flying off the handle. He was starting to move around with uh, people that were not part of the mafia. Uh, and this is kind of where I think they looked at someone like Carmen Persico and said, you know what? He's done a lot for this family. He's done a lot for us. I mean, he ended up killing Albert Anastasia. Um, he was doing things that uh, made sense. You know, he's kind of in control. We're going to put Iacovelli in as acting boss, uh, but Carmine's going to kind of take control at this point. Uh, and in April 7, 1972, it really all ends for Joe Gallo. Uh, Joe is out at a restaurant in Little Italy called Umberto's. Um, and this is when the commission basically puts it in motion that uh, Joe Gallo needs to go. Uh, Joe's in there with his family after seeing uh, a show uh, and a gunman runs into the restaurant and murders uh, Joe Gallo. Uh, it's been widely disputed as to who killed Joe Gallo. Uh, a lot of people have brought up names like Frank Sheeran. Uh, another person have brought up Richard Kuklinski yet again. Uh, Richard Kuklinski is not a mobster. Please stop talking about Richard Kuklinski. Okay. He's not in the mob. He never was. No. He never did anything mob related. Uh, he was in one situation, Roy DeMeo. That's about it. I've always led to believe that Frank Sheeran did kill Joe Gallo. Um, we'll never really know. Uh, a lot of people have led to the fact that 
A guy named Carmen DiBiase did it. Um, again, it didn't matter, though. Joe Gallo was dead. Uh, and by this time, Blackjack had had to happen. Um, and it was kind of an interesting hit, too, because when Joe Gallo was shot, he kind of staggers and falls out of the front, just like in the movie The Irishman. Yep. Um, he also attempted to shoot back, um, but his family was behind, and he didn't want to obviously at them, but he died on the way to the hospital. So, um, you know, he wore out his welcome in the mob. It had to, it had to happen. Joe Gal had to go. He did. He was a brazen, brazen character who just seemed to ruffle feathers everywhere he went. Um, and you know, uh, it's, it's unfortunate. His family had to be there for it. It was, it was his birthday is, is my understanding. But uh, interestingly enough, Umberto's clam house is still there on Mulberry street. You can go and visit it and have a meal where Joe Gallo was killed. Yeah, I know they've um, occasionally they've went there and 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 talked uh, to the owner about um, you know the restaurant. It obviously has got a lot of mob lore. Um, I hear they have great food. I definitely want to get over there soon. Um, we have to do that tonight. Maybe we should do an episode from there. Yeah, yeah, it would be a nice summer summer meal probably. Yeah. Um, got the roll bar, little Annie Post, love it. Uh, shout out to uh, Umberto's. Uh, head over there if you're in Little Italy. Um, so yeah. That was that uh, crazy Joe was gone. Um, in 1973, Carmine Persico again uh, is imprisoned. Uh, he's still imprisoned on hijacking and loan checking charges. Uh, but this would coincide well because his brother Alphonse Persico was released from prison. Uh, Carmine has basically taken control of the family and he assigns his brother Alphonse uh, to take over the family, be acting boss, along with uh, Jerry Langella, who was... Um, a supporter and underboss for Carmen Persico. Uh, six years would go by, and in 1979, Carlo, or sorry, Carmen Persico is released from prison. By this point, um, the family is a well oiled machine. They're making money. Um, and this is where um, Carmen really starts making money because uh, a young gangster by the name of Michael Francis uh, presents him with an idea that can really make the family money. If you know anything about Michael, he's out there. He's got a YouTube channel. He was the father, or he was the son of the the great Sonny Frenzies. Uh, Michael comes up with this gas tax scheme, him and uh, several other mobsters. I don't know that he created the idea, but um, he was part of the idea, and he was making boatloads of money. And I'm talking about not a couple hundred thousand dollars. He was making millions of dollars a month doing this, defrauding the government of gas tax. He basically went to Carmen Persco and says, hey, look, um, I want you to back me on this and I want us to really have control of this. I don't want anyone else to be a part of it. Um, and Michael kind of becomes one of the bigger earners in the Colombo crime family. Michael's generating at one point, $8 million a week, which is just, unheard of. I mean, that, that's just unheard of. Keep in mind to, to, to kind of put this into layman's terms, they're taking a portion of every gallon of gas sold in America, which is, an astronomical amount of money. Uh, according to officials, Michael Franzese was keeping about 75% of the profits, which would kind of add out to like 1.3 million a month. So Good God, Carmine was getting a very nice envelope from uh, Michael Franzese. So look, when you hear about Michael Franzese, Michael was making a ton of money uh, and he had the backing of, of Carmine and he would kind of talk about that later in life. In 1981, Carmine's out a few years. Um, he gets jammed up yet again in kind of a quirky, bizarre conspiracy <laughs> charge. Uh, he attempts to bribe an IRS agent in 1977 when he's in custody. Basically tries to basically go to him and say, look, I'll give you a half a million or a quarter of a million dollars if you get me out of prison early. I guess Carmine assumed that, that he would just do it and not tell anybody. Uh, he doesn't. <laughs> Carmine in 1981 gets five years. This is another one of those things you yeah, know, we said earlier. Yeah. We said earlier, like he's going to make some decisions in his life that you're going to look at and just say, what the hell were you thinking? This is another one, right? Like, first of all, trying to bribe your way out of federal prison doesn't work. No. And number two, an IRS agent. What the fuck kind of pull does an IRS agent have to get you out of the federal prison system? Well, None. I Zero. Mean, also, it doesn't help that like IRS agents are pretty by the sticklers. Book. Yeah, yeah. They're sticklers. I got a feeling like I guess maybe he thought like, I don't know if it was a CI or what, but like dude, you would have been better off trying to bribe a judge. Like this yeah. is a ridiculous opportunity that he thought would work. 
and like it cost him five years. Yeah. No, it, it's it it was definitely an odd decision to make. Um, but again, this is Carmine just trying to do a little too much. For as smart as Carmine Persico was, and I believe he was, I don't know what his IQ was. Um, he did do some things that were very odd. Uh, and and this was this was one of them. And and as you've kind of alluded to, it cost him, you know, five years of his life, basically. Um, you know, five more years that he would have to do inside. A lot of Carmine's time as boss uh, was in prison. Uh, he wasn't on the street very long. Um, you figure he takes over the family kind of in 1971. He's out for two years and then goes away, um, you know, in 1981 for five more years. Uh, by 1984, uh, Carmine Persco and the rest of the Colombo crime family leadership are indicted on racketeering. Um, and once this happens, Carmine's out of jail by now. Once this happens, Carmine basically says, look, I've had it. I'm not going to jail anymore. Um, he hears about this indictment and instead of going to, you know, kind of going away, he goes into hiding. He runs, uh, a nationwide man on starts. And in 1985, the FBI most wanted adds him to their list. Um, nobody knows where Carmine is. However, some disloyalty starting in Carmine Persico's life. Carmine goes to not far. He goes to Long Island, Hempstead, basically. Where um, my law school is. Yeah, he didn't go very far, by the way. Um, shout out to Carmine. Like, maybe he should have went to, like, Arkansas or, like, Minnesota or something. I mean, listen, you, we, we saw what happened, you know, earlier on when, when Profaci had to flee. He went down to Florida, right? right. He, he, went, he went two counties over. Yeah, definitely a ballsy move. But I guess who's going to think that he'd be that close, right? Um, he hides out in a um, home of his cousin, Fred to Christopher. He was a mob associate uh, and a family member. The problem that Carmine has is he picks the wrong family member. Fred to Christopher is a uh, FBI informant, and he basically turns in the Carmine Persco's at his house. Uh, the FBI arrests Carmine on February 15, 1985. Shrewd move by the feds, too, because as soon as he shows up at to Christopher's door, to Christopher tells them he's there. Yeah. And the FBI basically invents this whole manhunt so they don't burn to Christopher as a source. So yeah, they keep definitely, using him. Yeah, it's definitely well done by the feds in, in this case, for sure. I, that's a pretty good point by you. I never actually thought about that, but it does make sense. See, that's where your law background comes in. I would have never have thought of that. Well, if you got a good source, you don't want to burn him, right? You want to be able to keep using him. So you invent this manhunt so that everyone thinks, oh, well, the Christopher didn't give him up. There's a manhunt going on. They found that's one of that's one of the kind of keys I've heard from like FBI people and, and, and cops and stuff. One of the main things you have to make sure you do is to use and not get used by informants and make sure you protect right. your informants because any good cop, the key to a good cop is an informant, right? Yep. Um, yeah. If you've got a good one, you want to keep them. Exactly. So Carmen gets arrested and this is where it would all really end at least on the street for Carmen Persico. Uh, in 1985, Carmine's indicted along with uh, all the uh, New York uh, bosses uh, on the commission in a second set of racketeering charges as part of the commission trial. So basically, they round up Carmine Persico, Tony Corallo, Tony Salerno, Paul Castellano. Everybody um, that was the head of the five families was picked up and pinched. And again, the aim of Rudy Giuliani and the prosecutors was to strike all the crime families at once using the commission. And this is where Carmine starts thinking deviously and the other bosses start, start thinking deviously. The head of this commission trial was a young prosecutor named Rudolph Giuliani, um, who was Italian in his own right. As you know, Blackjack, he was from Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. uh, weirdly enough, I've always said this about Giuliani. Uh, if you know anything about his family, Rudy will always talk about he hated the mob. His father told him that the mob was no good. They weren't people that wanted to work or do anything. He had a lot of connections, though, to the mob. Um, Frank, you know, Rudy Giuliani wasn't any, like, coveted guy. He had connections to the mob, Blackjack. Rudy Giuliani's father was essentially an enforcer uh, for the mafia. So he, he had very close ties, you know, contrary to whatever stories he may want to tell. But... 
you know, it's it's worth noting that for whatever his family background was, when Rudy Giuliani was appointed to become the the United States Attorney for the Southern District of New York, this was his goal. This was his single focus was the mafia in New York City. And he was going to do everything he could to go after them. And nobody had ever used RICO statutes against the mafia. This wasn't, you know, people think that like RICO laws were invented because of John Gotti and stuff. No, it was Rudy Giuliani was the first one to use them that way. He had a different interpretation of the law and he applied it. And it really, I mean, Rudy Giuliani is, you know, one of the biggest reasons for the downfall of the mafia in New York City. Yeah, it's interesting because in 1970, this is where things really, at least no one knew about it, but this is when the mob really got a big slap in the face because a guy named Robert Blakey comes up with the RICO Act. He drafts the RICO Act. Richard Nixon signs it into law, and no one had really used it. But Giuliani was the first kind of main prosecutor to say, you know what, let's tie all this together and start rounding these guys up as a part of a, basically a corrupt. It was the only way to get the bosses, right? Because like we've talked, you know, when we did the Gotti episode, we talked about Paul Castellano, about how he distanced himself from things. Last week with Joe Messino, same thing, how he would distance himself from things. The RICO laws allowed you to get the bosses because you could tie what was going on in the street to the bosses just by saying they're part of the same organization. So that that was Giuliani's whole strategy was to cut off the head of the snake. Yeah, and by 1986, this trial is really kind of starting to get going. Paul Castellano, though, had been murdered by now, so he wasn't obviously going to go on trial, but the rest of the families would. And again, I'm going to bring this up because I always found this interesting, but I, I think we have to remember who the source of what I'm about to tell you is. So... In 1986, a Colombo hitman and informant named Gregory Scarpa, who we're going to do a show on probably in the next week or two. Greg Scarpa is a fascinating guy. So Greg Scarpa basically says to the FBI that the bosses of the commission, you know, of the families that weren't involved and some that were mainly John Gotti, Carmine Persico and others basically hatched a plan to assassinate Rudolph Giuliani. Um, but there were families that said, no, we don't want to do it. There is also word that Carmine Persico said, no, he did not want to kill Giuliani. I think there were certain people and the smart ones realized that if you kill per- if you kill Giuliani, that's not going to end this and it's only going to make it worse. Yeah. I mean, I'll say this. I do believe it. Um, I, I, I don't know whether, whether Persico was involved. I can certainly see John Gotti being involved. You know, I think that there probably was resentment with the fact that Giuliani was Italian, the fact that his father was involved with organized crime, yeah. and that he made this his single mission in life to bring them down. So I, 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 I give credence to what Scarpa says. I think the, the, the plot was a legit thing. I also understand why the commission rejects it, right? Because it's what you just said. You're not going to get rid of this if you kill Giuliani. It's the federal government, man. They're not going to run with their tail between their legs. They're going to double down. You kill a federal prosecutor, the next one is going to come after you tenfold. It's only going to make your problems worse, and it's going to make it more public. And what have we talked about? Publicity in the mafia is a bad thing. This would be a shitload of publicity. Yeah, so ultimately it doesn't happen because Rudy Giuliani is still alive today uh, doing all sorts of nutty things. Um, Yeah, getting drunk. Yes. At the start of the commission trial, when it would commence, Carmen Persico makes a wildly bad decision. <laughs> uh, and again, this is just kind of Carmen Persico. For as smart as he was, he made some really rash, dumb decisions. So Carmen basically thinks that because he goes to jail and starts reading law books in the law library, that he's a attorney. And he says that instead of hiring a lawyer for the most important case of my life, uh, because I am on trial for my life, I'm going to serve as my own attorney which it doesn't make any sense. He believed that he had sufficient evidence to defend himself. The problem was um, he would waive incompetent counsel as the grounds for an appeal. And he would really kind of hurt himself because as he would 
kind of cross-examine other witnesses, he would admit that he did criminal activity. So it really kind of put him in a bad spot. I, I will never understand this decision by Persico. Look, you want to change sides against Joe Gallo, fine. You want to bribe a, an IRS agent, fine. But like, you're on trial for your life. You probably want to get not only a lawyer, but one of the best, not yourself. This is, again, one of those decisions that just leaves you shaking your head, right? I mean, everyone knows the old saying, a man who represents himself has a fool for a client, right? Like, there's a reason why if a doctor tells you you need surgery, you don't just say, ah, I've got it, I'll do it myself. You're not equipped to do it. And he was not equipped to defend himself in the trial of his life. Uh, as you said, he would admit to criminal activity when questioning witnesses, which had to just leave everyone in the courtroom staring at each other with a blank look on their face. Like, what in the hell is this guy doing? You know, and the important thing is, you know, listen, I don't know if he would have had a lawyer, if it would have changed the verdict. It, it probably wouldn't have at this point. But you do suffer with appellate purposes because if you have a lawyer and the lawyer makes a mistake, well, that's a grounds for an appeal and a new trial. And now you get another crack at it. Now you've seen what the government has. Now you can go at it from a different point of view. It, you waive all that by doing it yourself. You can't argue, well, I fucked up. I like mean, that's not a defense. There's a lot of bad decisions in the history of the mob. This could be one of the biggest. This is awful. Yeah, it this really is. is God awful. Uh, in 1986, uh, it would all end, uh, at least on the street, for Carmine Persico. He was convicted uh, in the Colombo trial. And in late 1986, he sentenced to 39 years in prison. Uh, in early 1987, he faces the commission trial. He gets convicted of all charges and gets 100 years. So, Basically, he would have to run concurrently with the 39-year sentence. So at 139 years, he's 53 years old. Um, there's no parole in the federal system. So he was going to die in prison. It's that simple. Yeah, um, and it was particularly bad for them in the Columbos because Carmen Persica was only 53 years old. Uh, so you would assume, and I always found this interesting with the government. It's like the government doesn't understand that maybe we should put Carmen Persico in a facility where he can't still run the family. Um so they do try to do that, though. They sent Carmen Persica to USP Marion, which is, you know, one of, I believe, four 23 and one facilities in the federal system. So, yeah, I mean, prior to the facility, the Supermax in Florence, Marion was the yeah. toughest prison in the federal system. I think currently, as we speak, I think the only ADX type of prisons would be Florence and Terre Haute, which is death Correct. row for Correct. The feds. but yeah marion is tough as well john Gotti went there that's where they sent like really tough individuals usually you would go from mdc in brooklyn to marion that would be where you yep. would go if you were convicted uh so that's where carmen would start his sentence um and he basically had to accept that in 1987 he wasn't going to get out again but this is where it becomes interesting for carmen because you would think okay show's over uh, no, uh, this is kind of just kind of the middle of Carmine's reign. Uh, in June of 1987, Carmine gets a bright idea that he wasn't able to kill Giuliani. So let's try to kill someone else in politics and in prosecution. So he goes to a guy called Joel Cacace. They called him Joe Waverly on the streets. Joe Waverly was a, a dangerous guy. I mean, he's a lunatic. He killed a lot of people. Uh, he was the acting boss of the family while Carmine was locked up. And there was a, a U.S. attorney, William Aaronwald, that was making disparaging comments about the mob, which wasn't surprising. A lot of people were making disparaging comments yeah. about the mob. He also tries to prosecute several high ranking members of the Colombo crime family, including Carmine Persco and family members of Carmine Persco. So Carmine took it personal. So he goes to Kakache and says, look, um, you got to get rid of this fucking prosecutor, Aaron Wald. He's got to go. So Kakache sets up a hit squad of basically seven people to kill Aaron Wald. The problem is they put the hit in motion. They kill Aaron Wald. Uh, at least they think. It was actually Aaron Wald's father george arnold that they killed they looked very much alike uh and it was a mistaken identity kind of thing 
Um, so what Kakache then does is really one of the most perplexing, wild things ever that no one really talks about. So he gets these assassins that kill Aaron Walden and says, look, these idiots have to go. He recruits 12 assassins to kill those assassins. He then, after they kill the original assassins, he recruits 11 more to kill the 12 that killed the first round of assassins. <laughs> and just to be careful and sure, he basically eliminates those 11 hitmen with a fourth hit squad of basically 16 individuals. This was a fucking bloodbath. Yeah. <laughs> Again, another decision by Persico that just leaves you saying, what the fuck is going on in this guy's head? Now, again, here's the thing. Here, here's, the, here's one thing I will say about Carmen Persico. And by the way, over 30 people would die because of this. Yeah. Uh, here's the thing, though. Persico, I think, had realized he's never coming home. What's it going to matter, right? Um, but in 2004, Joe Waverly Kakache would plead guilty to the Ironwald murder and get 20 years. He only got 20 years. Um, well, no charges I, were filed against Carmine Persico. So it did work. Well, I mean, listen, it worked and it Somehow. didn't. I mean, 30 guys died. Well, what does Carmine care? He's locked up. And as far as, as far as Kakache getting only 20 years, you know, it's tough to prove a case after 17 years have gone by. You know, witnesses die, they disappear, they forget things, evidence gets degraded. It's not easy to prove a case 17 years later. Yeah, and most of these bodies were, you know, cold cases, I'd imagine. They didn't ever forget. Yeah, I would, I would imagine. Uh, so, yeah, Brooklyn was busy. Uh, in 1988, Carmen Persico uh, names Victor Arena as the new boss of the Colombo crime family because Kakachi was jailed up. Um, Carmine basically says to Arena, you've been loyal, your family. I think he was some sort of cousin of, of Carmine's. He gives Arena the acting boss. The problem was, and he kind of set it up from the beginning as kind of a negative interaction. He told Arena he could be boss, but when his son, little alley boy Persico, got out of jail, Carmine would make his son boss. So it really kind of sent him dissenting things from the top right away. But Vic Arena accepted it and said, you know what? I'll be boss for as long as I can, I guess. Uh, in 1990, Carmine would leave Marion and get transferred to USP Lompoc out in California. Uh, and Carmine starts uh, getting the lay of the land. He uh, starts getting involved with uh, activities. He becomes a uh, uh, bon vivant, if you will, at uh, Lompoc. Uh, he, <laughs> Great way to put it. <laughs> yes, he establishes the Italian uh, Cultural Club for inmates. Uh, he starts a band. Uh, this is true. He starts a band it, called called the Lompoc Four. Uh, he plays drums. Uh, and He recruits, uh, like his mob days, he recruits uh, a couple of friends of his, uh, one being uh, Anthony Center, who is a, a lunatic from the DeMeo crew. Uh, he was a body cut up guy, uh, a drug trafficker named Mark Ryder, and a patriarch of crime family concierge named Joe Russo. Uh, they basically come up with this Lompoc Four band and they start playing. How about that? So Carmine's really uh, getting uh, getting getting used to the prison life. Yeah, you know, I mean, he was in Marion, where, as you said, it's a twenty three and one facility. Yeah, it sucks. And now he goes to Lompoc, and he's got some freedom. And I think he just decided he was going to embrace life, as you said, he was a bon vivant. I, I mean, I mean, let me ask you: like, when you hear jail painted as this it doesn't sound that bad no i mean listen there's different you know, like levels. hanging out brother, playing in a band hanging out with the cultural brother, club there are so many different levels of incarceration you know you've yeah. got your county jails your yeah. state prisons your federal prisons i had a client once who was incarcerated in a, a kind of like a prison camp yep and like they had golden retrievers as pets they had sure. vending machines Yoga. like they could leave during the day like, I'm not saying it's good. You obviously still don't want to be there, but it sure as hell beats Marion. Yeah, and look, and this is, you know, if you're going to go away for life, um, being at places like Marion and, 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 and you know, ADX, like, that sucks. But, like, 
Yeah, if you're going to be in life, like being a wise guy is not real bad. I mean, they get pretty good food. I mean, they have friends of theirs there. They're, they're not going to get, you know, assaulted or anything. It, it's definitely the place to be. If you're, if you're going to go to jail for life, you probably want to be a wise guy. That would be your best situation. Uh, by 1991, uh, Vic Arena uh, becomes uh, sick of this whole scheme where he's going to be boss, but not too long. Um, especially after um, little alley boy Persico gets released from prison. And, you know, while this is all going on, John Gotti starts basically getting in Arena's ear saying, you know, fuck this shit. Uh, you're better than this. You should be the boss. Why the fuck's Carmine doing this? Fuck him. Do what you want to do. Why are you worried about him? Um, and Vic Arena kind of becomes emboldened. Uh, in 1981, he makes his move. He requests that um, – Basically, his consigliere, a guy named Carmine Sessa, basically go to the rest of the capos and soldiers and basically run a poll if they want him or Carmine as boss. The problem was Carmine Sessa was very loyal to Carmine Persica. They were friends. Um, they had been compatriots for a long time. And Carmine is furious. And this is when another war starts in the Colombo crime family. He orders a hit squad basically to kill Victor Arena and anyone that supported Vic Arena. It was kind of a sly move by Arena. You kind of don't blame him. He was sick of this power struggle crap. Why the fuck is he listening to Carmen Persia? Yeah. Carmine's in Lompoc. Alley Boy's not around. Why the fuck does this guy get everything? Um, he was making moves in the street. You kind of understand why he runs his poll. Don't you just wonder, though? I mean, this is 1991, so this is the height of John Gotti's power, right? Like Gotti eventually gets arrested in 92 and goes on trial, you know, that will, that will get him a life sentence. But 91 is kind of the height of John Gotti's power. Why wouldn't Arena just go to the commission with Gotti's backing and say, listen, why, why is this guy who's been in prison across the country for the last five years running this family when I'm standing right here? Like, well, I don't know why you just wouldn't go to the commission with, with knowing you've got Gotti in your corner yeah, and just say, hey, like, what are we doing here, guys? Like, we've got a guy running this thing from 3,000 miles away in a prison cell? Yeah, um, I, I agreed. Uh, I, I guess that would have probably been the better idea. Um, in 1991, that's kind of what happens. Victor Arena is going home to Long Island when he spots two large vans <laughs> parked outside of his house. Uh, and he basically realizes that, hey, this is probably not good. Uh, maybe I should just pass and act like I don't see them and get out of there. Uh, he recognizes the vans and speeds off. Um, and as he speeds off, he sees that every gunman has a machine gun, basically. Uh, for the next couple of months, Persico and Arena's factions try to broker peace, uh, even by going to the commission. But, you know, in, in talking about your point of view, Blackjack, the commission basically said, we're not getting involved. Um, we're not going to take sides here. Uh, you're going to handle this on your own. And Vic Arena, I think, realized he couldn't really do that. Uh, in 1991, one of Vic Arena's lieutenants, Will Cat William Catolo, uh, basically attempts to murder Greg Scarpa, who is one of Persico's chief hitmen. Uh, Persco loved Greg Scarpa. Scarpa was a lunatic. He killed a lot of people. Uh, and Victor, Victor Arena knew that. So it was time to kill Greg Scarpa. Um, there would be a lot of murders that would happen. In fact, um, public outrage kind of started. I mean, there were tons of bodies on the street in Brooklyn. People were sick of the wars. Um, even Victor Arena's loyal soldier, Nikki Grancio, was killed by a Persco hit squad in Graves and Brooklyn. Uh, he was shot over 50 times. So the, the Colombo family was spiraling out of control. Uh, they had no real leadership. Uh, Carmine was out in California, as you said, thousands of miles away. Um, people were kind of sick of it. In 1992, late 1992, it ends for Vic Arena. He gets convicted of racketeering and murder and sentenced to life imprisonment, dissolving um, the war with the Perskos. And again, the Perskos will come out on top they were control once again. So, you know, over the years, Carmine won a lot of wars. Uh, he always had people to run uh, at, and he was able to uh, kind of finish everything, uh, ending the war with Arena, 
Carmen would set up various structures for the family, including his son, Lally Boy Persico. Uh, and there was all, I'm not going to go through all of them because you'd be fucking drunk by the time yes. we're done with it. Um, I would. Yeah. Um, it, it kind of all ends though in 2001. F- be basically between 92 and 2001, most of the time the boss was little alley boy persico mm-hmm. uh little alley tries to kill um bill Catolo and and there's all things going on in 2001 persico uh pleads guilty to loan sharking charges accepting a 13-year prison sentence so little alley boy is going away again uh and it wouldn't last long because while he's in jail in 2004 he gets indicted on conspiracy to commit conspiracy to commit murder in the attempts on bill Catolo and joe campanella um, and that was really the end, uh, for Ali Boy Persico in 2007, uh, he would get convicted of another murder uh, and sentenced to life in prison. Uh, to this day, little Ali Boy Persico, Carmine's son is still alive. Uh, he's up at, uh, FCI McKean up in Northern Pennsylvania. And I know that by, I think I've told you this, uh, a friend of mine, uh, ha- jailed in McKean and told me that little Ali Boy runs uh, the facility as far as he knows. Uh, so maybe, maybe ask him if we can get him on the phone one day. Yeah, I might, I might have to try that, but you know, I know little, I mean, little Ali is, you know, he's a, he's a, he's mob royalty, as they say. So, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if he, if he's the shot caller up and again, that's a legend. I'm not saying he is, um, but FCI McKean's a pretty small place. And I'm sure that, uh, little Ali's getting along just fine. Uh, in 2004, Carmine Persico is transferred out of, uh, Lompoc, so no more Lompoc 4. That band is disbanded, kind of like... Uh, I'm trying to think of a band that was disbanded. Uh, do you know one off the top of your head? I should have figured like the Beatles? Out. Well, there you go. Yeah, the Beatles. They the were Lompoc like the Beatles. 4 and the Beatles. Yeah, they one were one. Very, very similar. They are both very Two popular. sides of the same coin. Yeah, they were the Beatles of the prison system. That's right. <laughs> um <laughs> The government transfers Carmine Persco to uh, Butner, North Carolina, which is a medium security facility. This is the lowest uh, security facility Carmine would be at. But at this point, you know, Carmine's 71 years old. Um, he's old. He's a senior citizen. You're not going to jail him at Lompoc. He's going to go to Butner, which is where they put white collar people and old people and that kind of stuff. Uh by 2011, it was reported by the FBI that Carmen was still the boss of the Colombo crime family and that the street boss at the time was a guy named Andrew Russo. Uh, the official underboss was uh, a guy called John Franzese. And we're going to do a show on John Franzese. I didn't mention John Franzese a whole lot in this show just because a lot of people believe that Carmine Persico didn't like John Franzese. Um, I think he always looked as John as kind of a an up-and-comer, someone that – had a lot of charisma, family liked him. He was powerful. Um, and he, I think he was always kind of threatened by Sonny Frenzies. Um, it's funny because in 2011, uh, a famous inmate would come to Butner. Um, mm-hmm. somebody, somebody named Bernie Madoff would come to <laughs> Butner. And I have a really good story about Bernie. So um, when Bernie went to Butner... He obviously never been to prison. He was a billionaire living in penthouses and, you know, houses out in Montauk and all these places. And so Bernie goes to Butner and Bernie doesn't know how you behave in prison. He didn't hire anybody, didn't know anything about it. So he goes into the TV room and goes basically up to the TV and just changes the channel. Almost immediately, he is slapped by, I believe, a Puerto Rican inmate. And Carmine gets wind of this and basically gets to Madoff's defense and starts palling around with the convicted swindler. Uh, they start playing Pinochle and bocce and <laughs> other old men stuff. Um, and he kind of teaches Bernie the lay of the land. Uh, and there has been reported a story that, and this is a true story too. It's not, I'm not feeding anyone bullshit. Uh, there was a story that came out as well that Bernie had learned a lot from Persco because he, went to the prison commissary at Butner and bought all the Swiss miss. And yeah. basically from what inmates said, he cornered the hot chocolate market. And if you wanted hot chocolate, you would have to go through Bernie. 
Um, and I have a feeling that that had something to do, and that had Carmen Persico's name written all over it. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, the idea of the two of them just like palling around and yeah. butter is a wild image. Like they must, they probably sat and just told stories for hours. Yeah. I know what say. the funny thing is. They probably very much respected one another because they were very similar type of people with the exception of Madoff not killing anyone. Yeah. I mean, they're both that, scam artists. Yeah. They both probably really appreciated the other's talents. I will say I would love to have been on a fly on the wall with, with those conversations. Oh man. You know? uh, in September, uh, 2015, it was reported uh, while at Butner, uh, Carmen Persico got a release date, um, March 20th, 2050. Uh, where he would be 117 years old. So he did see a light at the end of the tunnel, Blackjack. <laughs> uh, if he were able to live that long, keep in mind he would become uh, one of the oldest people in the history of the world if he's able to live that long. Um, Selwyn Rabb, one of the uh, great uh, authors, uh, talked about Carmen Persico's attempt to protect his own position and ensure that his son succeeded him nearly destroyed the Colombo crime family. Um and Rab also said his deceitful schemes led directly to 60 of his wise guys and associates being sent to prison as well as over 200 deaths. Um, Carmen was deceitful, man. That was really his, the snake nickname was truly perfect for him. Um, he was a, he was a scumbag, man. He wasn't loyal to anybody really outside of his family and his obsession with putting his son in control of the mob was not only out of line, but it was kind of sad, frankly. Um, you always kind of hope that if you're a criminal, your kid doesn't follow you in the same footsteps. Um, and there were a lot of guys that didn't want their kids involved. Uh, Lucky Luciano said that, you know, he would never have a child because he didn't want to raise him in a world where he was uh, known as Lucky Luciano. He, he kind of made that a point. And, you know, I'm not going to say that kids and mobsters works out. I don't know if it does, but Paulie Walnut said it best. Uh, marriage and our thing just doesn't work out. Um, I sure. think to be a mobster at your truest potential, you can't have kids. You can't have love. You have to be completely obsessed with single minded. Yeah. Um, on March 7th, 2019, uh, Carmen Persico would die uh, in Durham, North Carolina, at Duke Medical Center uh, at the age of what would he be? 80. I think he was 81, something like that. 85, 85 years old, 85. Sorry. So he didn't get far. I mean, he's about 30 years from his release date. Um, but, uh, that was the end for Carmine. Uh, there was a, uh, there was a funeral. Um, it wasn't big or anything. It's never real. They're never really big. Uh, obviously if you know anything about mob funerals, cops are always there. Um, mm -hmm. but gangsters have this thing about flowers. You know, we know about that from a Bronx tale, uh, on a wiretap. It was interesting though, because, up until Carmine's burial, basically, um, accused family members still loved him. Uh, on a wiretap, uh, Joseph Amato Sr. and a guy named Thomas Sorsha uh, were discussing the funeral, saying uh, Sorsha basically said that he got a brand new suit just in time for the occasion. He didn't want to look like a bum like everybody else, um, basically admitting that he represents the family and that he wants to be nice and sharp. In the same call, Sorsha also jokingly asked the motto that if him and another uh, co-defendant should drive the boss's body back to New York and, quote, would it move us up the ranks? Uh, so up until the end, uh, Carmine's uh, death was looked at as a badge of honor for a lot, and they still respected him. Um, not that it would make them boss. There's still a question of who the boss of the Colombo crime family is. It's interesting because... Most families have a pronounced boss at this point, mm -hmm. in, at this hour, um, not the Columbos. Um, one would believe that the acting boss is Little Alley Boy Persico. Um, why wouldn't it be? But um, there is thought that Andrew Andy Mushrusso is the boss as well. He's the cousin of Carmen Persico. Again, this is all alleged. We don't really talk much about current mob stuff, but... No. Um, as we do know now, there is no current boss in the Colombo crime family. The Colombo family would be the one not to have a boss because it just seems like the organizational structure was just fucking atrocious. I mean, they had three wars in 20 years. Well, which is 
a staggering number of wars. Persico established committees and, you know, different heads of, of government for the, for the family. Like it was just, it was a mess. I mean, it, it really was a mess. Yeah. And, and that was one thing about the Columbo crime family. It was always looked at as kind of the uh, black sheep, if you will. Um, the, the FBI called the Columbo crime family, the weakest of the five families. And a lot of it had to do with just this complete ineptness at the top, whether it was yeah. Joe Profaci or Joe Colombo or Joe Gallo and all these wars. And, um, you know, weirdly enough, I'll tell you who I think, and, and this is kind of the last thing I want to say about the Colombo crime family. I often wonder what the Colombo crime family would have looked like if Sonny Francis became boss, mm. because I think it would have went a way different way. And I think most would agree that Sonny was a stone cold gangster um, I think he would have been a great boss and I think he really acted the part. Um, so it'll be interesting to understand what it would have been. We'll never know now, but um, yeah, the Columbos are full of inept individuals that, you know, did do some good things. They obviously had the gas tax scheme and, you know, Carmine had made a lot of money and he did a lot of things, but his life I think is always drawn back to being a deceitful fuck that, um, made a lot of bad decisions, naming one, the attempt to kill a U.S. prosecutor, uh, defending himself in his own trial. Um, a lot of this led to his uh, downfall and his continued obsession with installing his son as the boss. Yeah. Um, but over and over. that's that for Carmine the Snake Persico. Um, fascinating guy. A lot of names, a lot of things, a lot of stuff. Uh, hopefully you were able to keep track. Uh, next week, we have another show, uh, and we will delve into another member of organized crime. We have so many people to do. We still have to do Lucky Luciano, Meyer Lansky, uh, Greg Scarpa, uh, Carlo Gambino, Paul Castellano, um, so many people. I, I mean, the, 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 the people are endless, as they say. Uh, Sunny Frenzy, so many people to do. Uh, so that'll be that. Blackjack is always great work. We'll talk to you next week. Um, make sure you uh, subscribe to the show. If you're just listening, you're new. Uh, we'd love to have you join us every week here. Make sure you do that. Uh, and uh, leave a comment. Let us know what you think of the show. You can follow the sit down on Twitter at the sit down seven. Uh, that's that, Blackjack. Hope you have a good week, buddy. Yeah, man. You too. Good episode. We'll uh, be back next week. Yep. Talk to you all then. This has been The Sit Down. Everyone have a great night. Bye-bye.